that I would like to read. I'm not going to do that right at the first. Actually, I'm going to read each portion as we get to that portion. So there's four things that I want to talk to you about today. <coughs> Excuse me. And I hadn't had really time to address the congregation about giving direction and uh, for the new year. If this morning you'll give attention to the four things I want to mention to you, I believe we can have one of the most tremendous years that we have had in the history of Nashville Valley Pentecostal Church. How many like to be challenged? Uh, how many like change? <laughs> now you just contradicted yourself. <laughs> All right? If you like a challenge, it's going to take some change. <laughs> All right, and if you'll admit it, especially as you get older, you don't like change. But uh, the Lord would have us to continue in our relationship and get better at serving him, uh, to offer more towards him. I want to be a better person in this year that he has put in front of us. And so four things that we need to talk to you about today. Amen. Now, Usually when New Year's rolls around, it's not uncommon for even Christian folks to gather together on New Year's Eve to have what they call a watch night service. And sometimes accompanying that, you make some what they call New Year's resolutions. I wonder how many really did that this year. Anybody make New Year's resolution? You don't want to change at all this year, do you? All right. <laughs> Sometimes when New Year's resolutions are made, someone says they're made to be broken. Well, we're far enough along in the month that if you've made those resolutions, they're probably broken by now. <laughs> For instance, some would say, well, I need to exercise more. Have you kept up with that? So I need to start a diet. Have you broken it? One that I would like to promote to you this, uh, today was the bread program that we have here at the church, B-R-E-A-D, Bible Reading Enriches Any Day. Uh, I'd love to see that program off to a good start, and yet we didn't have the chance seemingly to promote it, so I don't know how many have started. If you haven't, please, it's not too late to start. And just to read a few more extra chapters each day tell you, catch up. I look at last year's. I don't know how many started, but only three that I know of really completed that. I want to encourage you to read your Bible through this year. Uh, I know that Sister Porter, she's downstairs teaching, she always reads her through every year. My wife and I do as well. And in, the more that you do that, the more that you get a fully rounded picture of what the Bible is really about person is your pastor I try to read a book at a time not in one setting maybe two or three but uh, I've already got more than half of the New Testament read in this year <laughs> and uh, it's wonderful when you sit down and read a book at a time you get a more rounded picture okay so uh, if you haven't started yet please do so and when you begin to read the scripture this year don't do it so fast that you're not getting anything now they, they teach you to speed read in school any speed reading I do, I don't comprehend. Yeah, you got to slow down a bit until it sinks in. Uh, I guess that's if you're as thick as I am. <laughs> All right, so slow down. <laughs> if you speed read, sometimes everything goes into scramble. You know, this story and that story, you don't know which details are which and which story. So take the time to glean what the Word of the Lord is trying to say. In essence, this morning... What I'm talking about indeed is some New Year's resolutions, okay? Some commitments. If you have made a commitment, then you need a commitment to stick to the commitment. <laughs> all right? <laughs> That's what this year is all about. A New Year's resolution, resolve to do something? Well, resolve to keep the resolve. Make it stick. Now, if you're going to make a commitment or a New Re Year's resolution stick, then you need to be realistic with that resolution. In other words, don't make a commitment that you know you're not able to keep. Say, why? If you make a commitment you know that you're not able to keep, you're setting yourself up for discouragement and failure. Right? 
Now, I'm thankful that the God I serve is a God of second chances. If you fail one time, please get up and go again. Amen. The scripture tells us in Lamentations that his compassions fail not and they're new every morning. Aren't you glad for another day with a fresh start where you can worship God in spirit and in truth? Amen. And so there's four things I want to bring to you to help you to be a better person in this year. Don't wait till next January to start. Resolve to start now and keep at it. Now, a little humor might go a long ways right now to set the atmosphere. I've made a few New Year's resolutions myself. I've decided to eat more and exercise less. I decided to spend at least an extra half hour on the lazy boy rather than on my feet. I resolved to sleep more than I work. I resolved to spend more than I earn. And now you're laughing, okay? It wouldn't be hard to accomplish these goals. <laughs> you would be a successful failure. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So on a more serious note, if you're going to make a resolution, make the ones that will make a difference and change your quality of life. And if you're going to do that, it's going to come at some cost. In other words, some disciplines to follow through on the commitments that you make. So I want to start this year out right, and hopefully you do too with the things that can make a significant change in my life. Four things that I want to bring to you and encourage you from the word of the Lord today so that this year could be one of the most significant years in your life. Let's start with number one. Amen. You need to commit to forget your failures. That's hard to do. You say, why? Because sometimes they're so etched in your mind that whether anybody else knows about them, you for sure do. Forget your failures. The Apostle Paul, some 2,000 years ago, he gave us a scripture that still stands today in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, if that would come up on the screen. Brethren, he says, I count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind. Forget your past. Forget your failures. Forget those things that are behind. Then what you say? Then reach forth to those things which are before. He talks about, he says, I press for the mark, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you're going to move forward, you've got to forget the past. Especially the failures of the past. Now that's advice from God's word that has stood the test of time. And I don't know of any more relevant portion of scripture to start through this year than to tell you you need to forget those things that are behind and press towards the prize, the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you cannot forget your past, you would be in prison. Imprisoned by your own thinking, by your own mind, whatever. Now, I believe every one of us here this morning at some time or another has failed or not made the right decisions. But, you know, that failure probably was not advertised to the public. It wasn't printed on a, bull, a billboard or a newspaper. It wasn't heralded over the radio so as to make it impossible to forget. But they're for sure recorded and etched in your own minds. I bet you if you were to ask people in this congregation today about your past, most of them wouldn't even know. And if they did they would be quite willing to forgive you of the past. Uh, so where is the big problem with the past? It's right up here. All right? And so we need to forget our past and our failures to move forward. Failures are painful memories, but they weren't there to destroy you. Hopefully, you can learn from your mistakes and move on. All right? Maybe it was a ruined relationship, a wrong decision that you may have made, some inappropriate actions, maybe a wrong turn at the road, some bad choices. As a parent, maybe failed in some parenting skills, and, and maybe as a married couple for 
You've disappointed your spouse in some way or another. Maybe you have failed in your obedience to the word of God. Whatever the failures or the choices were, they were costly to us and to our progress in the Christian walk. Now would be a good time to just forget that and move on and live for God. Stop torturing yourself from what you did or did not do. The enemy would like to chain you to your past and to your failures, but Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of all your past. And if he's forgiven you, why can't you forgive yourself and forget about your failures? Now, I wonder if there's anybody in the congregation this morning that needed that advice, or am I totally irrelevant? (laughs) Huh? But I think if we're going to move ahead in 2015, we first of all need to forget the things that are behind. And then we're going to move ahead towards the things that the Lord would have for us. Amen? Number two, what else do we need to do this year? We need to commit to giving up our grudges. Now, let me lighten the moment here. I read this on the computer just this week. I forget who sent it to me, but it was there. Lady asked her lawyer for a divorce. So the lawyer said, you got any ground? She said, yes, 200 acres. No, he says, I mean, any uh, foundation? Oh, he said, yeah, he says, no, our, our house was built on a slab. No, you're not getting the point, he said, uh, Do you have a grudge? No, got two cars, but no grudge. (laughs) And uh, it goes on from there. I'm talking about giving up our grudges, okay? It's not your carport. And Well, for instance, he says, does your husband beat you up? Yes, twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays, he makes breakfast for me. Lady said, why do you want a divorce? Oh, I really don't. It's my husband. He says he can't communicate with me. Amen. I thought that was a little appropriate when we talk about grudges, okay? Listen to the words from Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. I'm talking about things from the word of the Lord that will help us in this new year. This is the scripture. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any... Even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. What is this saying this morning? It means that, I mean, Christ went to the cross of Calvary and died to forgive you. And surely uh, there's nobody that's done anything against you that's worth dying for, is there? (laughs) What is saying there? Jesus paid the extreme sacrifice and he wants us to forgive to the extent that he forgave. Now, that may not be real easy to do, but it is the word of the Lord. So we need to forgive like the Lord has forgiven us. Can we catch that challenge this morning? God is challenging us to directly and personally give up those hard feelings or those grudges. And what he means here when he says to forgive one another, if somebody has a grievance or against somebody else, it's time to give it up. Well, maybe you don't know what a grudge is. It's not a carport. We already established that, all right? A grudge is a deep, ongoing resentment that we cultivate in our hearts towards someone else. And a grudge will lead us to an unforgiving spirit and unforgiving attitudes, and then it becomes unforgiving actions. Now, uh... I wonder if there's anybody this morning, I won't ask you to admit it in front of the congregation, <laughs> that has ever held a grudge. Well, some did want to admit it, okay? Now, if you're holding a grudge, can I tell you today, it's time to let it go. You say what? Because if you don't, it puts you in prison. It really, it, it really locks you up so that you can't be the person that you need to be. Harboring a grudge is like nursing a wound. 
and it's an intense dislike for some person. Now, grudges are dangerous because they are destructive. Here's what they do. Grudges destroy marriages. Grudges break up families. Grudges ruin relationships. Grudges split churches. I've got one more here that only a few will relate to this that are here this morning, but listen to this. Grudges can even burn a fire department. No pun intended, and yet a pun intended. <laughs> All right? A few will get that. Let's be honest and admit here in the church this morning, one of the scandals that's hardest to overcome in churches is the grudges that Christians hold one against the other. It's not even Christian. Because <laughs> we are to forgive one another. Grudges eat at us like a cancer. They fester, they grow, and they destroy. Now we know that grudges destroy others, but do you realize they destroy you more than others? <laughs> Especially if you won't forgive. Amen. When you hold a grudge, and the Lord is saying this morning, come on, there's a year in front of us, there's lost souls to win, there's, there's the work in the kingdom. If you're going to move forward, you've got to give up the grudges. Amen. So make no mistake about it, if you're harboring a grudge, then eventually it will destroy you. If not physically, certainly it will destroy you emotionally and spiritually. It will make you a bitter and a twisted person and keep you imprisoned from doing the things that you really enjoy doing. In the book of Job, in chapter 21, it describes people who have no happiness at all, and, and they live, but they are dead in their bitter hearts. Now, uh, eventually, if I live long enough, and if you live long enough, you're, you're going to die, and... Uh, I do have some plans in the future what I want you to do with me if I do die. I, I do want a tombstone, <laughs> okay? But I would not want put on that tombstone died as a bitter person. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? Now, uh, it's probably in my genes. It's a sad commentary if I tell you this morning. My dad died a bitter person. Yeah, he was mad at God. He was mad at the world. He was mad at authority figures. And if you die that kind of a death, I can tell you that the afterlife is going to be much worse than this one. Enough said. Do you remember the parable in the scripture where Jesus told the story about a king that forgave a man a very huge debt. And just as soon as he was released of that huge debt, he turned right around and ran after one that owed him just a little bit, took him by the neck and was going to strangle him. He said, you pay me what you owe me. You know what happened when Jesus found out what that man did? And he reinstated the huge debt to the man and more. You know what he did? He said, you take that man and deliver him to the tormentors. Can I tell you that if you're harboring unforgiveness or a grudge, you're in torment. That's a prison. Yeah. An unforgiving spirit landed him in prison. And... Uh, Guilt, anger, depression, all these things keep us in chains that we really don't enjoy. So the Lord in his word tells us today, don't sentence yourself to prison or to torment. You say, why? Because Jesus paid the price to set us free. Give up on the grudges, forgive one another, whatever grievance you may have one against the other. According to his word, the way to give up a grudge is to forgive. Forgive. Now, notice what the, the word isn't saying here. It's not saying don't pretend something never happened to you. 
it's not saying to condone whatever was done against you. It's not saying it didn't really matter, it was immaterial. What he's saying to you, it happened, but let's move on. Forgive. That's the scripture, okay? Now, you say, how do you know when a person has truly forgiven? Here's the test. Do you still have a desire to see the person pay for what they did? (laughs) Or is there some revenge in your heart you'd like to get even? If those feelings are there, you really haven't forgiven. And the Lord is calling us to ma- or to give up on the grudges. Now, we don't know how many is here this morning, probably 40 maybe. They say that the average attendance uh, a church across our nation, across our continent, is around 70. Uh, the reason being is when you get in a company of 60, 70 people, that's when <laughs> there's enough people present for there to be personality clashes and and what have you. Okay, so in order to get beyond that, you have to become forgiving persons because someone will indeed offend you. And mark it down, you will offend somebody else. <laughs> Hello? It's not always someone doing us wrong, it's us doing others wrong. We need to live by forgiveness and let go of the grudges. So just the right amount to have some clashes or some infighting or some political maneuverings, and uh, it's impossible to grow unless we put some of this aside. Amen. Grievances, children against parents or vice versa, children against teachers or authority figures, teachers against other members or those that they would perceive to be a threat, and pastor who is the authority figure that we just won't submit to, Spouses that we don't want to love or be in submission to. Workmates that cause us problems. Someone that's got a difference of opinion than than we have or an ongoing argument. Jealousy because someone's a little bit more qualified than you. Resentment after resentment. The Lord in his word says this morning, give it up. (laughs) Come on, give it up. We need to grow we need to get beyond that as christians these deep-seated resentments against another person has to go if we're going to be a better person this year now don't tell god that you can't forgive he'll just say back to you no it's not that you can't it's that you won't (laughs) all right Now, if Christ can forgive you of your sin despite the pain that it cost him of going to Calvary, then surely his requirement for us to give up our grudges against anybody else wouldn't be that extent or expensive. But he is telling us to take our grievances to the cross and nail them there. Amen. So the question this morning is, Can you let go and forgive? Let go of your grudges. Let go of the past. Forgive the grudges. Go on, number three. (laughs) Three, commit yourself to restoring a broken relationship. Yeah. It's unique. I have a Mac computer, you might have a PC, but whichever. When you turn it on, there's usually a message that comes up there, and every time it's turned on, and it's wanting to know if you'll give it permission to go through everything on that computer and straighten out everything that's wrong. Does your computer do that? (laughs) Mine does, okay? This little glitch, or maybe you need to update this program, or or maybe you've got some uh, paths or data entries that's not crying. Would you like me to fix that before you start to work? Well, you'd be crazy to say no. <laughs> Amen? Because if you don't, it's going to affect everything you do that day. 
right? Can I tell you this morning that God offers you the same challenge? You're ready to start this day, this week, this new year. He says, let me fix everything that's wrong right now so that when you start to work or do whatever you have to do, it won't affect in a bad way what you're about to do. The Lord would like to do that today, restore even broken relationships. Amen. Now, here's how that challenge goes about. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, I like that phrase on there because sometimes it's not always possible. But if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If it be possible. Now, why did the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome put that phrase there first? If it be possible. Sometimes it isn't. But the next phrase is just as important. As much as lieth within you. In other words, on your behalf, make sure you've done everything possible that you know to do to make sure it's right. And to live peaceably. Amen. So the phrase personally challenges each and one and everyone to restore a broken relationship. Now, some relationships can never be restored. Say so why? Because it takes... Uh, cooperation on both sides. Now, cooperation on one side is not enough. You've got to have cooperation on both sides, all right, in order for a relationship to be reestablished. Okay, that's why it says, if it be possible. Sometimes it's just not possible. But make sure that every effort on your part has been made. So let's be honest. Some relationships in our life have gone wrong, not because of what somebody did to us. It's because of what we did to somebody else. That's why the Lord says, as much as life within you, if you know that you have done something wrong and a relationship is astray because of it, it's up to you to do as much as lieth within you to make it right. That's the scripture. So the everything includes here, including asking for forgiveness and saying you're sorry. Sometimes it's very difficult to ask forgiveness because you don't know what the reaction is going to be on the other side. <laughs> and why do we fear that? It's because sometimes <laughs> we're the one on the other side. <laughs> and we know how we would react. But if somebody asks your forgiveness. And if somebody apologized to you, you are bound by the word of God to forgive. I've had a few situations in my life, I'm not going to mention what they are here, but uh, where I've tried to make some things right, even as pastor in a congregation, some that you deal with and in trying to make things right, the breach gets bigger instead of being healed. See, what happened there? Well, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably, but the other was not willing. You can't restore relationships that way. Amen? But the scripture still binds us. As much as lies within you, if there's a breach, whether it's on your part or somebody else's, do everything within you to make it right. Amen? Uh, you, you've probably, uh, I'll use marriage as an example of this one. People, marriages break up, and here's the reason. Irreconcilable differences. What do you mean, irreconcilable differences? It's when one or both parties are not willing to reconcile. That's the only thing that makes it irreconcilable. Unwillingness. The scripture tells us 
we must be willing, as much as lies within us, live peaceably with all men. Now, if you've done everything within you to restore a broken relationship and it's not restored, then it's not your problem. Forget the past and move on. <laughs> Forgive the grudge and move on. All right? Sometimes you have to distance yourself if someone is unwilling to reconcile. Now, what causes the grudges or the griefs or the uh, ruined relationships to begin with? Usually cutting words, harsh remarks, uh, the calling of names that's inappropriate. Who's ever said that as a kid? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's not true. Amen. Is that gospel this morning? Did I surprise you by that? Amen. I, I, I'm telling you, the Lord expects that what comes out of our mouths will be minister grace to those in our company, not harshness or, or uh, something that would cause a breach. Amen. What causes us to say things that we shouldn't? Selfish motives, ungodly ambitions, the desire for fame or recognition, Desire for power. You know, it's so easy to offend people. It's a lot easier to offend than it is to live peaceably. Yes, it is. It's very easy to offend than it is to live peaceably. But according to the scripture, as Christians, we need to strive or make an effort to live peaceably. You know what that tells me? And I should have written the scripture down, but I know it's there. Let me quote it to you. All right. Forbear one another. What does it mean to forbear? There's some people that it's hard for you to tolerate. Anybody got someone like that in your life? <laughs> yeah, I like that reaction. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Everybody has got someone in their life that's hard to tolerate. But as much as life within you, <laughs> live peaceably. What's that mean? Sometimes you got a butt in your lip when you just feel like ripping them up and down. <laughs> Amen. Okay. And so it just sometimes you bite the bullet. <laughs> it's the only way you can keep peace. Well, what about the other side that won't bite the bullet? That's their problem. <laughs> Not yours, okay? Uh, it's easier to offend than it is to strive for peace, but as much as lies within us. I want to ask you a question this morning. Which side you'd follow on? Anybody get those uh, quizzes or tests on, on Facebook that's all the rage now? What's your personality? Uh, uh, what's your favorite color? What car are you going to drive in your old age? And uh, Answer these ten questions, and they can come back and pretty much tell you and be on. <laughs> I've done a few of them, okay? Uh, but the car that I'm going to drive, they were way off. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know how they do this or suggest, but anyway. Uh, I wonder if I should put one on there. Are you a troublemaker or a peacemaker? And ask the questions and find out what it is. Which side would you land on? Uh, I want to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. As much as lieth within us, the Lord would have us to do that. Amen. So would you rather console somebody or fight? And what's your nature? Amen. And when it comes to the subject of restitution, it deals more with uh, personalities than it does property. <laughs> uh, you know what it means, restitution. If you stole something, you take it back. That's property. Well, restitution also, if you've offended somebody, you try to make it right. That's also restitution. Make things right if you've said hurtful things or done hurtful things. Restitution is to ask forgiveness of the harsh words, the quick tongue, the cutting remarks, the heartaches that you may have caused somebody else. Now, it's a lot easier to make a, a property restitution than it is a personal restitution. 
It's just the way it is. This year, we need to forget those things that are behind. Amen. We need to let go of grudges. And as much as lies within us, we need to restore a relationship that's gone bad. Ever say amen? That's three. Do you want number four? <laughs> okay. These four things can really make a difference in your life this year if you commit yourself to it. Number four, we need to commit ourselves to turn our back on sin. Turn our back on sin. Make a commitment to do it. Scripture in James chapter 4, 17, that's not on the overhead this morning. I thought of that after I come here today. All right. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Amen. We need to do good. Uh, in doing, I need to put something in here. Does anybody know what the golden rule is? There, okay, sister quote it again. The golden rule. Right. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, sometimes we'd like to twist that a little bit. Do unto others as they do unto you. That's not what the, the golden rule is. It's do unto the other as you would have them do unto you. In other words, how do you want somebody to treat you? That's how you're to treat them, whether they treat you right or not. So that means that we return good for evil. Hard to do unless you're a Christian. <laughs> Correct? Because we want to treat others as we would want to be treated. Turning our back on sin. Okay. In the scripture, and there's what is known as the year of Jubilee. What was the year of Jubilee? It's that time when all properties were turned back to its original owner and where slaves were let go free. Everybody looked forward to the year of Jubilee. There was always a countdown to the year of Jubilee. As a matter of fact, your property, your house, or whatever you own, if you were going to sell it, with each year that comes nearer to Jubilee, it was worth less. See, what happened? Because at the year of Jubilee, it wasn't going to be yours anymore. It went back to whoever owned it. So if you're in year number 25, <laughs> towards the year of Jubilee, your house is only half worth of what, half of what it should be if you want to sell it. Because the year of Jubilee, it's no longer worth anything. It goes back to the original. Now, we don't operate in that principle here in, in uh, New Brunswick or in Canada, do we? <laughs> Our property goes up and up and up and up as each year passes. But if Jubilee was in sight, <laughs> the closer you get to there, the worth it would, or the less it would be worth. You say, why? Because you don't own it. If you pay taxes, you'll never own anything anyway. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right, you always pay rent for it afterwards. Okay. The lease would run out, in other words. All slaves set free. There is a case in the scripture where it tells us that there were some slaves who opted at the year of Jubilee to continue to be a slave to their owner. Have you read that in their Bible reading? And if that was the case, the owner would take that slave to the fence pole and drive an all through his ear. You're mine, not just for the next 50 years, but forever. I don't know what's wrong with those kind of people. Chance to be set free and don't take it. Pleased to work in slavery? That don't make sense to me. Does it to you? No? Well, let's look at it in a Christian sense. Jesus paid to set you free from every sin. And yet some will choose to go back to that life. What's wrong with your head? <laughs> Hello? Why continue to live in slavery when Jesus has set you free from sin? Now, the book of Romans has much to say about this. Okay? 
To some folks, sin just becomes a way of life. When Jesus set you free from it, he even gave us the power of the Holy Ghost so that we could live victorious and free and live an overcoming life above the reproaches of sin. Sin is not supposed to have dominion over you. We are supposed to be able to control sin. Sin is a very bad master, especially if it gets the upper hand. It's going to take you further than you want to go, cost you far more than you want to pay. But Romans 6 and verse 2. I'm talking about some godly principles here that will move us forward in 2015. Forget the past. Right? Let the grudges go. <laughs> Restore a broken relationship and live above sin. That's the keys to success, isn't it? As a Christian. Romans 6 and 2. God forbid. Uh, verse 1 said, uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Here's God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In other words, you repented and died out to sin. Why is it that you would continue on in a sinful way? How many ever had a vehicle that's been recalled? Why do they recall the vehicle? It's because many people have the same fault with that vehicle. It's the same thing. Over and over and over again, you call in, my vehicle's doing this. Yep, I'm telling you exactly what's wrong. What is it? <laughs> That's why we're recalling them. It's the same thing over and over again. The master is doing a recall this morning. What happened? That same thing that haunts you over and over again, that he died to set you free from, you can live free and above it. Amen. He serves another recall notice this morning. In, the, in Christian terms, you know what we call that or what Paul called it later on in some of his epistles? He calls it a besetting sin. Those sins that easily beset us. What happens here is when Christians live a double life, they want to serve the Lord and yet they battle wrongdoing and sin. To the point that it becomes more comfortable living with the sin and living with the guilt than to get rid of it. Critical attitudes, lusts, perversions, bad habits, addictions. What are we talking about here? We're talking about sins that we like to become comfortable with when the Lord says, give it up. Hello? Hello? So God, in his word, challenged us to turn your back on sin. Wow. Jesus broke the power of death on the cross, gave you his Holy Spirit on the inside of you to live above and to help you to resist sin. Amen? Yes, he sure did. So you don't have to continue on in this year with guilt and uh, and, and all these negative emotions because you can't get victory over some besetting sin. God says you don't have to be a slave. Amen. If you've been set free for, from sin, don't act like a slave. <laughs> don't go back and let the enemy put a, an all through your ear and say you're mine forever. <laughs> what the, live above repose. It all boils down to this. In this new year, a lot of people have taken a 2014 year calendar and set it aside maybe even burn it in the garbage and they put a new one up that says 2015 if that's all this year is for you a changing of a calendar <laughs> that's not much to look forward to and this year we need to commit ourselves to forget our failures commit ourselves to give up on the grudges to forgive others commit ourselves to restore a broken relationship and commit ourselves to put sin behind us and not have dominion over us. If we can do those four things, we're going to have an awesome year. Amen? Praise God. Let's stand this morning. Praise God.
Sister Irma, teach your packet of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah.